All right, let's, uh, again, I want to set the terms of our conversation so that we can have a good conversation and make sure that we uh, hear from each of these candidates. Uh, each of the candidates will have two minutes for an opening statement. Uh, after, uh, and we will do that in alphabetical order. Uh, after the opening statement, in the series of questions that I have prepared for the candidates, the first two questions will be for all of the candidates to answer, and we'll go in reverse order on that first question, and now we go up again, so that we can be listening to After those two questions, where we're inviting all of you to answer, uh, I will be uh, uh, posing other questions, uh, and questions that any candidate is free to answer by indicating their intention to respond, and I will recognize you as I see. So if you are first on the draw, I'll try to hope I'll see you uh, and make sure that you get the first, but that I will certainly uh, call each of you uh, who wishes to answer the question. We have also asked audience members to write down any questions they may have on note cards, and with time remaining, I will choose a question from the audience to pose to you, any candidate, unless you are uh, identified to answer the question. Uh, any candidate is free to answer by indicating their intention to respond, and I will recognize you for a response. A timekeeper will keep time, indicating when you have 30 seconds remaining, uh, and then when you have arrived at time. Uh, and we uh, wanted that so we can get as many questions in uh, as possible. And for the audience, I know that you might hear something that you really like. But I invite you to withhold those applause until the end of our conversation and with the exception for right now. Please join me in welcoming uh, these candidates with a round of applause. And now, starting opening statements, starting with uh, Mark the Housing Day. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being here, and I see friends, and I see colleagues, and I see some very friendly faces, and perhaps all of the above. Um, I am a mother. I'm a nurse. I was a nurse, a lawyer, and a prosecutor, and a former judge. And on a personal note, I got pregnant before Roe v. Wade. And you'll read about my whole story this Sunday in the, in the paper. And um, I had my daughter, but everyone's circumstances are very different. And I will defend a woman's right to choose as the next Hennepin County attorney. I'm running for Hennepin County attorney because I want to restore the um, effectiveness and rebuild the trust in the office. And my primary concern is public safety. And public safety is not a political slogan for me. As a community prosecutor and as a serious crimes judge, public safety is my profession. And as someone who lives in North Minneapolis and who, who has felt the uprise and the effect of the uprise and, and violence in my community, it's my life. And some people will say that North Minneapolis has always been that way, it's always been dangerous, but that's not true. I was able to bring crime down quite significantly in the Murderapolis days. We were very successful. The office received a national award. It worked, and we can do it again, but it takes the collaboration of everyone and the ability to work with all of our justice partners. Jarvis. As you know, my name is Jarvis Jones. The reason I decided to run, because I believe we've been given a false choice. The false choice is between having states, having I think they're all. No, they're all. This one is off. Hello? Uh, the reason I decided to run is quite simple. 
I believe we've been given a false choice here in Minnesota, in Hennepin County. The false choice that we hear over and over, we got to have safe streets. I agree 100%. But at the same time, we need to make sure we're treating all residents with dignity and respect, regardless if that resident lives in Medina or in Minneapolis. We must do both at the same time. We will not have safe streets in our surrounding communities unless we have a prosecutor who is a bridge builder who will go out into the community, who will build trust with that community. I grew up in the inner city of Chicago. I know what it means to not trust the legal system. I know what it means to be put to work for any while black as a male. I know what it means to be treated as a suspect person. But fortunately, I also know what it means to have a brother and sister who are inner city Chicago police officers. So I have that balance and know that overwhelmingly, most police officers want to keep us safe and go home safely to their family. My background in a nutshell is I was the first African American president of the Minnesota State Bar, over 28,000 voters. First African American president of the Hennepin County Bar, a little less than 9,000 voters. Also, I was elected twice president over the Minnesota Minority Lawyers Association, an umbrella for all minority lawyers. So I've been always out there acting as a change agent, a bridge builder, and someone who gets things done. Thank you. That's you. Okay. I'm Tab Jude, and come from Maple Grove. My wife Jacqueline is in the back here. And my background, uh, I'm a father, grandfather, uh, practice law. I grew up in central Minnesota delivering candy, groceries to small businesses. And I've grown to love Minneapolis. I've grown to love Hennepin County. Uh, people have asked me to run. Uh, they would like safer streets, safer neighborhoods, and a safer Hennepin County. And I've had the privilege of representing well, at least 20 of the cities in the county. It's a big county. It runs from Fort Snelling out to St. Bonifacius on the west, up north to the city of Dayton. But Minneapolis is the heart of Hennepin County. The roads, the rivers, railroads, everything centers here in downtown Minneapolis. And you represent, I'm glad you're here today, uh, because you represent the heartbeat of the city. And what happens here, what happened on July 4th, can never happen again. We shouldn't have the chaos. We shouldn't have needles on the MTC or Metro Transit. We need to make it a welcoming, inviting, thriving, free place. I'll do that by making crime illegal again. By way of background, I've been on the 10th district bench for 11 years, most recently handling all types of cases, anything that would come in the courthouse door. But before that, I was in the legislature 16 years. Uh, six years in the state Senate, 11, or 10 in the Minnesota House. I was on the Hennepin County Board. I believe I am uniquely qualified to be your next county attorney. Thank you. Mary Moore Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I am the most qualified candidate to become the next county attorney. I spent my career doing 31 years of criminal law practice in Hennepin County. I was the first woman chief public defender in Hennepin County. I'm the only person here that's actually led a large law office of over 140 lawyers and 70 support staff. I teach at the University of Minnesota Law School. I've taught people who want to be prosecutors and defense lawyers at Harvard. My very first suppression case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. So I am ready to start day one. My opponents have accused me of being too progressive. I am incredibly proud of the broad and diverse coalition we have built all over the Hennepin County. I am proud to have the endorsement of the DFL. I'm proud to have Moms Demand Safety 
survivors lead. Um, over 30 elected officials across all uh, county and local lines, and community members from all over Hennepin County. I'm a believer in collaboration. When I was chief public defender, I was head of a committee charged with looking into solutions for mental health uh, and substance use. And you know who I reached out to? Shane Zahn. You all know Shane, right? I knew he was doing good work downtown, and I was trying to collaborate to make sure um, that we could work in partnership on how to improve the downtown. Because the downtown is the most vital part of this uh, state, and we need it to be vital. I had season tickets to the Timberwolves. I've lived in Minneapolis. I've lived down, or I've worked downtown for over 34 years. I want this to be a vital place to, for everybody to, to come and thrive. Um, finally, as Hennepin County Attorney, I will hold people accountable for crime. And that includes community members and police. Because that's what we need to do to build trust in our community. Thank you. Paul Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Downtown Council and the Minneapolis Chamber for hosting this really important uh, forum today. This should be one of the most important discussions we have this year for Hennepin County voters. And I say should because as we sit here near the end of what has been a hard fought primary season, I must say that I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in the lack of substance from my opponents and the lack of ideas they have offered so far in this campaign. What I mean by that is this. When I first entered this campaign, I was excited to have a robust dialogue with the field. I saw then, and I still see now, uh, that this open seat is a unique opportunity to tackle the violent crime striking the heart of our communities while also expanding the rights of everyone in an accountable criminal justice system. I was excited for that campaign like this. Instead, what we have had is a campaign of ideologies and political factions. The DFL, the GOP, and the ongoing civil war in the Minneapolis Democratic Party. I believe that Hennepin County deserves better. I believe Hennepin County deserves a county attorney that doesn't wear any of those hats, but is committed to working with everybody. I grew up in Golden Valley. I have lived in Northeast Minneapolis with my wife and children for 34 years. I'm an assistant county attorney where for the past 12 years I have fought to keep people safe from violent crime, prosecuted drug dealers who poison our kids for profit, and work with criminal justice partners. I've served as a leader on the Minneapolis City Council where I built a reputation as a community leader and a bridge builder. I would be honored to serve as your county attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. I also want to thank everyone here in the audience. Thanks for taking the time to come out and get educated about this really important race. It's unlike some of the other offices that are on the ballot. You need a legal license, and it's kind of like being a fire chief to a fire department. So thank you. I also want to say it's so wonderful to be back here at Ty's Lounge, um, and for the Chamber of Commerce and Minneapolis Downtown Council, I went to one of your events right here just a couple months ago. So thank you for continuing to be engaged with the community and having conversation. So my name is Sir Suti Singh, and I'm running for Hennepin County Attorney. That's to be the top prosecutor, and I'm a prosecutor. I handle murder, sexual assault, domestic assault cases, and everything in between. I work a lot with little kid victim survivors all the way up to older folks and work with small businesses on property cases and other types of cases. I have a wealth of experience, but I'm going to jump into what my priorities are and we'll talk about my experience later on. My priorities are public safety, police accountability, and racial equity, and all three at the same time. I think you can't have safety, true safety, or justice unless you're addressing those three. And no matter where I knock in Hennepin County, whether it's in Edina or Eden Prairie or North Minneapolis, everyone wants to be safe. 
I want to be safe. That's why I do my job. You have to address the murders, the carjackings, the violent crime. With police accountability, you have to hold police accountable. I know you guys have high standards for yourself. So should police, and we should hold them to that higher standard. And then third, racial equity. The whole world knows what's happened here. We need to address it instead of just turning a blind eye. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming out to hear this conversation to the Minneapolis Regional Chamber and the Downtown Council for sponsoring this uh, conversation. Um, I'm running for, uh, my name is Ryan Winkler. I am uh, currently the Majority Leader of the Minnesota House of Representatives. And I am running for the Office of County Attorney because the status quo on crime and justice in this community cannot continue. In the summer of 2020, I was working with my colleagues in the legislature to try to address the fallout of the murder of George Floyd, civil unrest, and the need to pass significant police reform in Minnesota. And as I engaged with local officials and watched the way that that summer played out, I saw how important strong relationships and strong partnerships between public safety and justice partners need to be in order for us to be successful. Too many organizations, too many jurisdictions, too many offices, too many leaders have an influence in this process, and if they don't work well together, major cracks open up and problems happen. That's what we are living through right now. Not only the rise in crime and the inability to respond meaningfully in certain cases, the lack of trust in too many of our institutions and the feeling that we are powerless to do something about it. I have laid out a, a P3 plan for public safety to improve policing, prosecute violent crimes, and prevent crimes through early intervention and diversion for chemical dependency, juvenile crimes, and for people who are suffering from mental health challenges. We have the tools and the resources in this community to address the situation and create the kind of public safety system that we all want but we have lacked the kind of leadership it takes to get it done. My time at the legislature has taught me, in many cases the hard way, how to be that kind of leader. And I want to bring that leadership qualities and that experience to bear to create the kind of public safety system all of us want. Thank you. And um, we're going to get to that first question that, uh, that I think some of you will address and give you an opportunity to get very specific, starting with Mr. Winkler. Uh, as you know, there have been increasing concerns in the suburbs especially, but all over the county, about increases in crime. And there have been vocal demands for more aggressive prosecutions, including prosecuting more people. Aside from that, what specific programs and policies would you implement as county attorney? Or what would you do specifically to reduce crime and increase public safety in the county. Again, please be specific. One of the biggest challenges we have right now in public safety in addressing crime is that our law enforcement uh, officials don't necessarily have a good relationship with leadership at the county attorney's office. Our communities don't necessarily have good relationships with either. And <laughs> Some music? Is that? I don't know. So, I'm just going to wait. <laughs> what do we go for up here at 4 o'clock? resources we have more effectively. Uh, we have too many gaps that have opened up between law enforcement and the county attorney's office in terms of priorities for charging and the kind of uh, work police need to do to create cases that can be uh, successfully charged. 
We need to have more of our law enforcement resources focused on investigating violent crime across jurisdictions and better collaboration among the justice partners working to stop crime. We are not going to be able to hire our way out of this challenge with hiring more police officers. Even if we tried, we don't have enough to do it. We need to figure out a way to co uh, collaborate and coordinate better across jurisdictional lines in order to take on violent crime first. Carjackings, armed assault, murder, those crimes have to be solved and there have to be charges and there has to be accountability. We also have to address the concern about the revolving door uh, for juveniles who are arrested and quickly turned back in the street. For many good reasons, we've moved away from incarceration as a model for juvenile crime, but we have not replaced it with an effective uh, solution involving monitoring and community intervention. Without strong partnerships, we are not going to be able to address any of these concerns. And when you talk to people, uh, whether they be police uh, chiefs, uh, prosecutors, people uh, who have experience with the federal government, they all say we need to use the resources we have more effectively because we cannot hire our way out of this problem right now. Um, the, um, the bigger, longer term fix for crime is better intervention. We cannot continue to cycle people through our criminal justice system uh, based on crimes related to mental health or chemical dependency. We need to find better ways of using diversion resources to create better results for them. We need to get more resources into communities that have too long been under-resourced. That is the long-term best solution to address crime. But right now, we need to use the law enforcement tools we have more effectively to address the most violent crime first. Thank you, Reverend. Okay, here we go. When it comes to public safety, there's multiple things that I want to do. I'll, I'll, I'll focus on two. Um, one of the things that I want to do is move prosecutors over from the drug unit over to the violent crime unit. So I'm a prosecutor currently in Ramsey County. I used to work in Hennepin. And my caseload during the pandemic quadrupled. That's true for a lot of my colleagues. We were working every single day for months. And the court shut down multiple times for months at a time. And defendants have a right to a trial, and some defendants were released pending trial. We still have this backlog in part because of public safety coming to head with public health. Jurors would come and they would get sick and you need all 12 to convict or have any um, uh, verdict. And so, I'd like to move prosecutors over from the drug unit and reassess our drug policies within the office. There's been a lot of changes when it comes to marijuana. I don't think it makes sense to prosecute some of the marijuana cases on low level drug crimes, where it's not a threat to public safety and it's a personal amount. There are obviously more serious level of drug offenses, and those are different. And I think the reason why you want to have more prosecutors in the violent crime unit as well is because those are some of the more complicated play cases and we have so many victims. That includes big business owners and small business owners. And it's important that we address public safety seriously because I live here in downtown. I love it here. I've changed my behavior because of things that I know. I'm not, I think, overtly scared, but I'm also not I'm just aware, right? And you have to address public safety so people want to go to businesses and feel safe and things are thriving again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reverend, thank you. I have to talk really fast because I have a 10 point plan. When I talked about this plan, I met with police chiefs from all over Hennepin County. I'm going to go over this 10 point plan. Let's see if I make it in a minute and a half. First of all, we're going to end catch and release, which is Letting people out when they're on probation or parole, violent repeat criminal offenders, we have to let get hold them in custody. That's a huge problem. Number two, empower victims of violent crime, especially our immigrant communities. Number three, let's get those stolen and illegal firearms off the street. Let's work with federal law enforcement. Uh, let's make sure, especially with assault weapons, which are blowing up, that we do that. Number four, let's fix our broken juvenile justice system. It was a huge mistake to close the ranch in, in Minnetonka. Uh, the chief judge said don't do it and we're now letting dangerous juveniles back out of the street when we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, we need to aggressively prosecute carjacking cases. I very much disagree with, uh, with uh, House Majority Leader Winkler who would not vote or pass the bill on carjacking. Places all over the country have passed those bills in response 
to the carjacking we see right now. Similarly, I am very upset with the failure of leadership in the DFL to pass the fentanyl bill. Fentanyl is killing twice as many people as guns, and yet there's extremely little penalty for, for selling fentanyl. We should be aggressively prosecuting those people who are killing our kids with fentanyl. Uh, we're going to enforce the law. We're not going to automatically have categories of offenses that we don't charge. We'll use diversion, we'll use states of adjudication, but we won't simply say we're not going to charge offenses. Uh, frankly, that's lawlessness and it's not a good idea. Uh, we're going to support lawful traffic and investigation stops. We are not going to say that just because something's a traffic stop, we're not going to charge it, even if there's a firearm or there's drugs in it. That's a policy that Ramsey County has adopted. I love some of the things John Choi has done, but that, in fact, was a huge mistake. We're going to increase transparency in all charging decisions. We're going to make public all those charging decisions so the public has a right to that. And finally, we're going to create a criminal justice system, coordinating system to address violent crime in our county. I led those efforts when I was on the city council, and I can do it again. Did I make it? You made it. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not going to talk that fast. Um, I care very deeply about public safety. And I was the victim of a violent crime. And I don't purport to speak for everything victims want or what all victims want. As Hennepin County Attorney, I need to hold people accountable. As I said, whether they are community members or police. Many of you read the Human Rights Report. And one of the things that people didn't really uh, probably notice is that Hennepin County prosecutors said that they were having a problem prosecuting cases because of the behavior of the Minneapolis Police Department, which is on video. So here's some specifics. I've seen a lot of video as a public defender, and prosecutors see more video than anybody else, including police leadership. So as Hennepin County attorney, here's what I promise I am going to do is to flag that video. And when we see policy violations, both small and big, I, we are going to partner with police chiefs so that they see what's going on. Some of it might just be a conversation, like what's going on with the cop? Why was the cop behaving that way? Some of it may be bigger, which requires me as county attorney to hold that cop accountable for criminal behavior. But that is not happening now. And it's something that I feel the county attorney's office has to step up and do. As many of you know, I did a lot of commentary on the Chauvin trial. One of the things national press asked me is, how did MPD get to be this way? And one of the things I said to them was, it's not just MPD, and it's culture. And to change that culture, any police department is not going to be able to do it alone. We all have to help. And to be able to prosecute crime, we need good police work. We need to have police officers who do a good job so we can prosecute cases. Thank you. We, we've got an issue in Minneapolis. We've got an issue in Hennepin County. And the issue is that we've come through a pandemic. We've had to try to depopulate the jail. We've had to try to depopulate the juvenile justice center. <coughs> We've closed the county homes. We've closed St. Joseph's. We have a gaping hole right now in the area of juveniles. And we've got 20 and 21 year olds who know the system. They'll recruit a 15 and 14 year old to go out and steal a car. We have to address that. We need to fill that gap. I will work with the county board. I will work with the legislature to fill that gap. We also have state hospitals for mentally ill. We don't have those anymore. But we don't have the community resources we need to fill the gap. And I will work with the county board so we don't have the mentally ill populating our jail. But we need to get back to some normalcy. Get back, we've all gone stir crazy with the pandemic. And that's particularly true in the courts. Oftentimes, I was the only judge in my courthouse that was there on site. I handled everything, anything that would walk in the door. I promise I will be on site every day or in the community every day. Because we need the trust of the community. And I'll work with the community in terms of community circles, ways to involve victims, 
So again, give perpetrators a chance. But we need to have better than 40% in solving our homicides. We've got downhill. We need to have the resources to go in, have juries that reflect the county, get convictions on solid evidence. We'll have the prosecutors follow the facts, follow the evidence, apply the law, get back to normalcy. That's what I wanted. Yes. Yes. So, thank you. Um, I have a detailed, short, and long term plan. I, I know you've heard that no one up here has a plan. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that's coming from. I would encourage you to go on my website and you will see it is the most detailed plan. Unfortunately, I can't read this plan in two minutes because it's not a two-minute fix. That's the bad news for us. One of my favorite presidents is Harry Truman. People said, give him hell, Harry. He said, I'm not giving him hell. I'm just telling him the truth of it. It feels like hell. Now, what I'm seeing is, there's not anyone up here, even though they may think it's going to be tougher on crime than me. I grew up on unsafe streets. My closest friend, was brutal, childhood friend, was brutally murdered. So if you believe we can lock folks up, and that's going to solve this problem, like you try in Chicago and every urban area, you're wrong, unfortunately. Yes, we're going to lock people up. I pledge to you, we're going to take back our streets, we're going to take back our neighborhoods, and we're going to take back this downtown area unapologetically. I'm not apologizing. Now, how do we do that? Not talking tough. We have to build bridges in the community. We have to earn the trust of the folks in the community. People know who's committing crime. We have to build trust. And secondly, I will part with the key stakeholders, folks sitting around here, to make the changes. I wish I could tell you the prosecutor office alone to make the changes we need. But I will have to part with with the public defender, the judiciary, and law enforcement. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm going to tell you, we have to change the narrative. You know, after George Floyd's death, we had all these people standing up and saying, defund the police, defund the police, get rid of the police. OK, so you send out that message. And then you turn around, and you have all these people committing crimes. And then what do we tell them next? We don't have any police. We're down 300 police officers. So what do you think happens? Total chaos. we got to change the narrative. And my narrative is going to be, we are going to aggressively prosecute serious, violent criminals, like I did when I was at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office for almost 10 years. And we are going to put them in prison where they belong if they're convicted. Now, there are alternatives to um, incarceration. And that needs to be uh, put in order also. And those are our treatment courts. Those are our um, diversion, restorative justice. Those can be put in practice too. But we have too many dangerous people out in my community uh, since George Floyd's death. Uh, Minneapolis alone, North Minneapolis where I live, has had 90 homicides, okay? And several of them were children. We know that. That's unacceptable. We have to change the narrative. I'm the only one up here who has worked at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office with prosecutors, not defense attorneys, with prosecutors. I'm also the only one up here who's managed an office of prosecutors, not defense attorneys. They work on the other side of the aisle. The prosecutors take care of the victims of crimes. The defense attorneys, we know what they do. They represent the criminals, OK? That's the exact opposite of what the Hannibal County attorney does, OK? And that's what we need to do. We need to put our emphasis back on protecting communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and starting with uh, Ms. Deming, this question is for each of you going in alphabetical order. After George Floyd was murdered by law enforcement, 
there was a lot of attention on uh, Minneapolis specifically. Um, and the National News Outlets wrote accounts of a historic pattern of the county attorney, or what looked like a historic pattern of the county attorney, declining to bring charges against officers for, for police involved violence, especially when the victims were black or of color. How would you work with, how would you work differently with the Minneapolis Police Department to ensure that officers, officers reliably exhibit the highest professional standards and demonstrate exemplary conduct? And how would you hold them accountable when they do not? I know that we've had a recent report from the Department of Human Rights, and it was deplorable. It told us everything that we already knew about the Minneapolis Police Department, that there was rampant discrimination in communities of color. I'm waiting until we get a, a consent decree, and I'm, in, I'm encouraged that there is going to be um, some specific um, criteria set forth in how to repair the police department. We have to have a relationship with the police department that provides us an avenue to work with them to get rid of police officers who are fired, which means that once they're fired, they don't get to go in front of the um, board or the arbitration board and give them their jobs back. That can't be done. We need to also report bad behavior right away. If we see a police officer during one of our charging decisions, um, that perhaps violated someone's civil rights or violated their civil liberties, we need to address that immediately. I have, as both a county attorney and as a judge, when I saw misconduct in front of me on the bench, I sent that information over to Chief Arredondo. And I did that on a regular, at least a regular basis in cases where I, I thought that the police officers, well, for one thing, the testimony didn't match the body cam video, and um, I sent that information over, and I wanted to know what is what is the um, consequence here, and you perhaps should use this video in your training sessions of what not to do. I also think that the police department is broken. I do think that um, the the culture is damaged, and I think that the training has to be done by an outside entity. We don't want the training to be done by the officers that have been brought up through the department because they learned all that bad behavior. They learned some of that militaristic um, you know, uh, context in terms of how to deal with, with the public, and that's not acceptable. I appreciate the question. I view a little differently. I am definitely an outsider. I can't claim 20 40 years of experience in the criminal justice system. I don't think that's what we need. Why? When we believe that someone with 20 to 40 years of criminal justice system experience is going to make the fundamental changes we need at this time. Every three years, two, three years, we have the same as I'm just going to make change. Well, why the changes aren't happening is people want to talk about law enforcement. They are a problem. But as a change agent, someone who's used to making fundamental changes, I'm here to tell, suggest to you, it's at a fundamental level. Law enforcement does what it does because the prosecutor office allows it to bring, the prosecutor office brings those charges. If the prosecutor office stopped bringing the charges that it knows has disparate impact, singling out individuals in some of our communities, they will stop spending their time doing it. The prosecutor does what it does because the judge allows the prosecutor to do what it does. So what do we do? Yes, I've heard many folks say we need to work together. The key is working together with the key stakeholders to make fundamental changes to our system. That's what I've always done. I've worked with different key stakeholders. When I was president of Minnesota Minority Lawyers Association, we talked over and over, lawyers need to raise the standard of ethics and eliminate bias. While well, I and some other argued before the Minnesota Supreme Court, 25 years later, all lawyers still have to take every three years CLA credits on eliminating bias and ethics. We had a problem with folks not doing pro bono work. I work at the state bar, Hennepin County Bar. Now all lawyers have to file a report every year stating 
that uh, listed how many pro bono hours they do to help those who cannot. That's the kind of change we need, I believe, on a fundamental level. I would see the county attorney working with the police departments, but in an objective manner. Uh, there has to be both the cooperation, you know, continuing education. The, the best invention I've seen in recent years has been the body cam, has been the squad cam. And when you go to a jury, that's what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for that transparency, the best evidence, and of course you have everything on TV now in terms of forensics, but there has to be that continuing education from the county attorney's office with the police departments, with the post board, the police officer standard and training board at the state level. And the county has to demand that we have that best evidence that's credible. And that's where we need to have the best and the brightest in our police forces and, and working. And then of course we need the mental health support. We need the health for our juveniles. We need to fill those gaps. And we can do that. But we need transparency more than anything else. And we need to have a consequence for wrongdoing so the victims can be made whole as best as possible, if at all possible. And there's a consequence that the criminal sees and that criminal justice system is made to work. And the county attorney's office is a key pay in making it work. But transparency, the trust of the community has to be there. And I will work on that every day. So Chief Arredondo and I uh, collaborated for many years. Actually, before he became chief, he invited me to come to implicit bias training that was being done with the MPD. And I was sitting at a table with a lieutenant who, before we started, said, and this is a quote, this is fucking bullshit and a fucking waste of my fucking time. And at the end of the day, when the uh, moderator said, what are your goals for the next year? He stood up and he said, I want to maintain the warrior mentality because that's why I became a cop. And I was thinking about this and it was then I was thinking, this is a culture problem. It's not a bad apple problem. You can hire people with lived experience who want to do the right thing, but when they're put out there on the streets with him and Chauvin, that's what you get. And so we have to help. We have to help with the culture. And what does that mean? You know, the Human Rights Department was not a surprise uh, to me at all, because as a public defender, I have seen this behavior, which makes it hard to prosecute cases. And I want to give you one case as an example as a problem here, why there is little trust in the community and why we need to build trust so community members will talk to police about who's committing these crimes. And that's the Jaleel Stallings case, right? The county attorney's office charged Jaleel Stallings with attempted murder, even though later when the body cam was released over the objection of the county attorney, we all saw Mr. Uh, Stallings uh, on the ground face first being kicked in the face by a, a police officer and then beaten for 30 seconds. He was charged with attempted murder, found not guilty, and Jaleel Stallings, and the, the officers were never charged as far as we know, and the county attorney's office has never made a statement about that. We need to do better. And I will be accountable to the public, I will be accessible to the public, and I will explain decisions like that. Thank you. We have a culture problem, but it's not a police culture problem. It's a problem of a total absence of political leadership. That's what we have. Uh, and I am so sick of law enforcement being blamed for the mistakes of their leaders, both the elected officials and frankly those who led the police department. Those rank and file officers, that's not a culture <coughs> that's broken. It's their leadership that's broken. You know who hates you know who hates bad cops? Good cops. So what we end up having a choice between is meaningless and dangerous political theater or empty talk. That's what the debate was last year. That's all it was. Two years after George Floyd was murdered, what did we do as a community? We did absolutely nothing. We had some folks saying abolish police, and we set people on the other side and made excuses. 
for a leadership that's failed. Frankly, I would not accept Mayor Fry's endorsement because I'm going to need to be an honest broker when that consent decree comes out. And one of the most serious things that have been done, and this is unique to Minneapolis, 90% of the sustained violations in Minneapolis result in what is known as coaching. And those are not available to the public. They're not available to defense counsel. It is an outrage. It's mentioned in the Human Rights Report, and no one is doing a damn thing about it except, frankly, me. Long before I entered this race, I was involved in filing a lawsuit on this issue. Because that's what I believe in. I believe in solving problems. And that's what I'll do as county attorney without fear or favor, without representing some faction, without representing or supporting my political allies. That's what I'll do, and we can fix this problem if that's the kind of leadership we have. Thank you, Reverend. I want to start off by saying police accountability is a public safety issue. I want every single one of you and your staff and your family to feel safe calling 911 not worrying that it might exacerbate the situation like when Officer Chauvin responded to George Floyd. I don't want anyone to have that thought when, they're, when they need help. But that's where many people in the community are at. And I can tell you when I worked in Hennepin County, there was a Minneapolis police officer who testified on the stand and sound, sounded so credible. And one of the attorneys said, just watch the squad video. We did. It completely contradicted the officer's testimony. That wasn't every officer, not by any stretch of the means. But that officer, what they did was wrong. And it impacts every case that they've touched. Because when an order comes out that brings that evidence to light, that hurts victims. Imagine if you're a sexual assault a victim, and an officer responds, and the officer is attacked during trial, and then there's acquittal because of that. I don't want anyone to have to deal with that. That's just wrong. And so I have a number of plans on my website, but one of the things that I want to do is embed a prosecutor with the Minneapolis Police Department. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office already does this with sexual assault cases, and I think it's been a fantastic success. We need to do the same thing with regarding training on excessive force, standards, the basics, and where we expect people to be. I work with police departments um, throughout Ramsey County, but frankly, when I worked at the Minnesota Attorney General's office, I worked in 62 counties, working with many, many sheriff's offices, troopers, you name it. It makes sense to make sure they're trained, and there's excessive force training where We've avoided awful situations. I've had those cases and I'm grateful for it, and I think you would be too. So that's one of many things that I would do. <laughs> the essence of your question is how can we hold the Minneapolis Police Department accountable while simultaneously working with them to solve crimes and make sure that we are prosecuting people who are harming others? I think the essence of the answer to that question has to be about respecting the work that law enforcement does. You have to have a basic respect for the role of the police in our society and that basic belief that what they do is necessary. Uh, I think many people have extremely positive experiences with police officers, helping them in a difficult situation, showing up at the right time. A lot of people have very terrible experiences with police officers who show up with a very different mindset. Minneapolis is going through a very challenging time right now in uh, reconstituting its entire police department. I had an opportunity recently to speak with Cedric Alexander, the new commissioner for community safety. I think he is an outstanding pick, a person who understands the need to shift a department's culture. I think it is partly cultural. Uh, to hire people who have high character and high integrity, to work in partnership with other <coughs> police departments and who really is looking out for an opportunity to show that the Minneapolis Police Department can serve every community in Minneapolis. But the county attorney has to approach police officers and their departments and leaders with respect and believe that that partnership is essential. That does not mean turning a blind eye when they do something wrong. It doesn't mean not holding them accountable. I have proposed an independent accountability unit within the county attorney's office, separate from line prosecutors to evaluate police behavior, to look at situations 
uh, where maybe they shouldn't be allowed to testify in a particular case or where there may need to be a charge brought of some kind. Uh, I have uh, answered the question from the Minnesota Peace and Police Officers Association. Uh, they invited me into screen. The first question was whether I supported a grand jury process for charging police officers for murder and manslaughter, and I told them no. That doesn't mean we don't have a good relationship, but if you approach their work with respect and are honest about where you disagree and look for opportunities to partner and build better relationships and better culture, we can do a lot of good work together. Thank you. Uh, any one of you can, uh, any one or all of you can answer this question. Uh, in light of the concerns about increasing crime, there appears to be a backlash against justice reforms for low-level offenses and diversion programs, especially for juveniles, which were implemented to address things like mass incarceration or racial disparities in prosecution and uh, to, to uh, deal, put our focus on the most violent crime. Uh, those issues are still very relevant, but what would you do to reduce the number of juveniles brought into the criminal justice system if those things are not working to your advantage? Um, or what policies would you implement to ensure fair and unbiased use of prosecutorial discretion when charging juveniles? So a lot of the decisions that prosecutors make are subjective. And I think just like any all of us, prosecutors have unconscious bias. And so we need to keep data, and we need a data person, um, to make sure we're keeping track of racial and gender disparities and then put in place policies that will hopefully impact that. In terms of juvenile, we've, we've failed our youth, um, and we're seeing the consequences of that right now. Um, we need to hold youth accountable but we need to give them the services that they need. That includes trauma-based mental health, chemical dependency. Those are a lot of the issues that I worked on as chair of the behavioral committee in Hennepin County. What's happening right now, one of the things is, the county did close the county homeschool, which I think ultimately would have been a good thing, but they didn't build out any alternatives before that. And so now we have these situations where there really aren't a lot of places to send youth who are engaging in behavior that's harmful to others. So I would advocate, I have good relationships with the county commissioners, that we need a lot more services in community. Because what we've done is send youth to the prison in Red Wing. Um, we've certified them as adults and sent them to adult prison. Uh, we send them out of state. Um, and none of that is terribly helpful to youth. It doesn't serve them well, and they keep coming back into the community worse than they were before. So we need many more services in the community that are based on trauma, the specific needs that youth um, have. I believe very much in adolescent brain development as science. If we know youth are impulsive, they do age out of some of this. Some youth need to be separated from the community because they are harming other people but we also need to give them the programming, the therapy, the services that they need so they're not coming back into the system and they can live the productive lives that we and they want to lead. Uh, regarding the juveniles, one of the things I would do is, let's uh, talk about carjacking. Soaring out of control. Well, I believe in treating juveniles like juveniles when they're acting like juveniles. Both putting the guns someone hit it, it's not acting like a juvenile, even though they are a juvenile. When I say we need to think outside the box and not play around the edges, I don't believe we need more community service. I think we need more accountability. Most young people in the community know, hey, I'll be out by 18, and so what? And we start over. We need to reform the juvenile system to have much more accountability built in for serious offenses. And so they know they're going to be held responsible. Secondly, I reject the question that Minnesotans don't want criminal justice or social justice reform. We're tired of Democrats. I'm a lifelong Democrat all my life, being soft on crime, being afraid to say we're going to take back our streets, our neighborhood, and the downtown area. That's what we're tired of. I bet every one of you wants social justice reform that people of color are treated like people in Edina or Minneapolis. I bet everyone wants that. But you're tired of seeing this crime getting out of control and our politicians putting their hand over, hand over their mouth, talking about
talked about 20 different things. Crime is out of control. There's some bad people out there, unsafe. Let me tell you, I grew up with them. Now, I understand most people are. Last, oh, am I kind of, my kind of, no. Oh, good. <laughs> Last thing I want to say, I'm outraged when I sit up here and hear, clearly, there's no cultural problem in the police department. If I take off my suit right now, take off my bow tie, and I go in Minneapolis at night, I will be just another Negro walking that Negro, walking down the street and be subject to being pulled over. I've been pulled over so many times when I'm in Minneapolis out of this suit. So there is a cultural problem. My brother and sister are police officers, and blue, there is such a thing as a blue wall. So the good cops don't tell them the cops who are doing wrong. So we need to make cultural changes also. Thank you. We have a gap in Hennepin County. We need to do something in Hennepin County, and I can work with the county board and with the legislators to fill that gap for juvenile justice. We can't have the 20 and 21 year olds directing the 14 and 15 year olds to go out and steal cars. We can't have a criminal justice system that just is so understand, understood that the criminals understand. The 14 and 15 year olds are going to be discharged, but go back to mom and dad. We need to support the mom and dad. And that's why we need the programs, so that the mom and dad can be the best the mom and dad as they can possibly be. Some have, some have problems. It might be a drug problem, it might be another type of problem, but we need to have that support system so they can be the best. But the basics are meant for the child. And that's why we need the county home school, or we need St. Joseph's. So it can be the best mom and dad, and that's what we, those, those children need. And we need a criminal justice system that's appropriate. Yeah, you're talking about low-level crimes. We need to have livability crimes enforced in an appropriate way. It's got to be aimed at what the problem is. And not go overboard, but not ignore it either. Because if you ignore it, you get to my fourth. Uh, you get what happened out on Bloom Island. Uh, you get fireworks that are commercial grade, aimed at people from cars to other cars. You have to have laws enforced on Metro Transit. So it's inviting to go on Metro Transit and have a family on Metro Transit. You need to have laws enforced at the park so we can go and play it. And that's what we'll do. It'll be appropriate. But we need the programs. I'll work to do that. So I work, I work because I work with the Anoka Hennepin Drug Task Force with, with officers uh, in Hennepin County. And I've also, of course, spoken to many of the police chiefs. Uh, and one of the questions they get asked by especially juvenile offenders who don't know where they are, they'll say, what county am I in? And I'll say, Hennepin. And they go, oh, thank God. True. Because they know for some of these offenses there simply is no consequence. Um, if they steal a car in Hennepin County, there simply won't be a consequence. Um, and it's that old expression, it's cruel to be kind, because what are we really doing with these juveniles when we give no consequence for the lower level behavior? They graduate to worse behavior. And then at some point, the consequences are much more severe. At some point, their consequences have lifelong uh, consequences for them. So uh, I do think that to answer your question, we, I'm very much in favor of the Reverend Diversion Program, states of adjudication, which are mandatory on a lot of drug cases. I think we have to do a better job, and I think the county attorney has to be more actively involved in making sure that the supervision on the Diversion Program is active and is working. Um, but I, I reject what I see as the false choice between holding the serious offenders accountable while also providing an option for those lower level offenders to make sure their records are expunged and their futures are not compromised. Thank you, Reverend. I know when we've been out talking with the community, I often hear, why are there so many carjackings and why are they so many of them committed by juveniles? And I can let you know what's been happening. We're seeing a lot of juveniles in the criminal justice system. They haven't been in school for two years. The pandemic hit and they lost their structured, safe and healthy environment. What happens when you lose your safe and healthy and structured environment? Trouble. 
right? Especially if you're a teenager. It's to be expected. And I can tell you with my cases, this is not everyone doing these types of things. I have defendants where I, they have one case, then another auto theft, another, and now they're bringing a gun while they're stealing the car and escalating. It tends to be the same people over and over again, at least based in my experience. So you have to hold the people accountable, especially when they're bringing a gun to the scene, right? That's dangerous. But at the same time, don't push away the alternatives. One of my other priorities is crime prevention. There are factors that made crime worse the last few years. There are factors that can make crime less. So let's do it. For juveniles that are willing to put in the work, and I really mean it, and there are structures in, pay, play, in place in the court system where we're, we have those options, and we can put in more structures in place with those programs, and where the court is implementing them, right? Because you probably read the Star Tribune article about how some parents felt, I'm having trouble controlling my kid. All my other kids are okay, but this one, they're, they're just getting wrapped up in the wrong crowd, and I, I don't know how to handle it, and I need help. So let's help. Provide that structure, provide that accountability. Be basically the court being a parent. I think it's what a good Hennepin County attorney would do, and that's what I would do. The beginning of your question was, are we going to give up on the reforms in the criminal justice system that we have made and the momentum in that direction because of a rising crime and the reaction to it, the backlash to it? If we do, uh, we will be making a huge mistake. We have a real opportunity to address rising crime, not through mass incarceration, not through over-policing or a militarized police approach to certain neighborhoods and can, trying to contain crime in certain neighborhoods so that people in uh, downtown or in other parts of the city or in the suburbs don't see it, don't hear it. The fact of the matter is, the most likely victims of crime are people of color. The people who I talk to who are most practical about making a difference in their communities are in places that have been uh, receiving the least resources for the longest period of time. And whenever I, wherever I go in Hennepin County, people want the same thing. They want to be safe. They want to be able to call uh, the police if there's a problem and somebody that will show up and help. They want to believe that the justice system is basically fair. And we have an opportunity now to create the kind of justice system, the kind of public safety system that we want. We can invest in community resources. We can partner with the people who are out patrolling their own neighborhoods. We can have police who are hired based on their commitment to community service and train them to be capable officers. We can make our justice system uh, more colorblind by better data analysis and doing a lot of the things that we're talking about here. We have an opportunity to do it. And I think all of us uh, have to be, and not just the candidates, but all of us in our community have to believe that we can create a safety system, a public safety system, that actually works for everyone, finally, because we have never had it before. If I may be the last one to comment, I'd like to bring this back to general crime. I'm very concerned about what's happening in Hennepin County, and I say Minneapolis, uh, because family life is broken. The family structure is broken. Minneapolis has been denied, um, North Minneapolis has been denied facilities for children. I go out to um, the suburbs and I see these um, high, you know, high tech places, um, community centers, rec centers that are all set up for these kids out there, but we don't have anything like that in North Minneapolis. They cut the after school programs. They don't have camping programs for the kids during, you know, during the summer. And what do you expect these kids to do if they don't have any avenues? Their families are broken. They're dealing with parents that are struggling to support their families, put food on the table, and make sure that there's a roof over their heads. They're also struggling with the fact that, you know, jobs are not, are, are not easy to get. Um, these kids aren't going to school. We've got a truancy problem with our kids. I mean, you can talk about the pandemic, but a lot of these kids weren't going to school. We have to put more emphasis on prevention, and we have to put more emphasis on getting into these schools and dealing with these kids and these teachers immediately. I would think in the middle schools, I would think in the high schools, and you probably might want to try elementary schools. 
I remember back in the day when I was growing up, and I'm sure some people in this audience also remember, we used to have a civics class on how you're taught on how to be a good citizen. You're taught on how to respect one another and yourself at the same time. We're losing all of these values. We're not, we, the kids don't have them. They don't respect their teachers. They don't respect their parents. And we've got to stop this. We have a broken system, and it's due to poverty. It's due to the fact that people can't, don't feel safe in their communities, and they also don't feel like they're able to take care of their families adequately. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I want to get to more audience questions. We are we are running out of time, but at least three audience members had a variation on the same question. So I'm going to uh, try to get all of their questions into one to get at what each of them were uh, trying to ask you. And it, it refers to your management experience. Um, each of the the questioners are raising. Uh, the idea that you, you, if elected, you would be running uh, a large uh, public law office of, of 500 plus employees. Uh, and what I think they're trying to get at, and I want all of you to answer this, uh, um, what, is, what is your philosophy, management philosophy, what is your experience that makes you uniquely qualified uh, to run a department of 500 plus employees, a large public law firm or law office. Let's start here, we're going uh, down the line. All right, I think it is a critically important question. Uh, the next county attorney will serve in an elected office that will be a high profile, high pressure position. The county attorney staff will have to uh, be bought into the vision of what the county attorney is trying to accomplish and the county attorney will have to bring in leadership uh, to help run the county attorney's office that the prosecuting uh, line attorneys, staff, and others can believe in and support. Uh, it is not an easy thing to run a large organization. Uh, in the last four years as majority leader of the Minnesota House of Representatives, I've been the number two person. It's uh, a organization of 400 people, about a, a similar size budget to the county attorney's office. And not only did we have to run the House of Representatives, we had to reinvent it for a global pandemic. We had to address civil unrest and police reform during George Floyd. We had to maintain the governor's emergency authority every uh, month for uh, over a year. And we had to do that, uh, in our case, having 68 out of 69 Democratic elected officials show up every single day and vote the same way. Uh, we had to do that with, uh, uh, while diversifying our staff, we had to do that while moving up in the ranks, people who came from uh, communities that had been historically excluded from the Minnesota House of Representatives and we had to remake the culture of the institution to elevate those people and those voices and their leadership. And we have been successful in doing that. Uh, the next county attorney is not going to be a person who's in the courtroom. The next county attorney is not going to be a person uh, who has to have uh, years of experience on the bench. You have to have experience leading a big public institution through challenging times and I'm the only candidate in this race with that experience. Thank you, Reverend. I oversee a state agency. Governor Walls appointed me to the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans. I represent the over 50,000 Indians in Minnesota. I know many people don't know that. And I love the job. I'm an extrovert. I love people. And um, that's one set of experiences. I've managed a government affairs department. In my previous career, I was in politics. And did hiring, recruiting, lots of traveling, everything in between. Um, I've also, as a prosecutor, recruited, helped hire, and retain, mentor, and train prosecutors and other legal professionals. I've actually won a National Leadership Award, as well as awards from my colleagues, as well as from management in my own prosecutor's office for leading discussions on race and the law because we had to pivot, because we were having difficulty with prosecution after George Floyd was murdered and needed to take a beat. I have extensive leadership experience, and I also think Mike Freeman's leaving after over 20 years. It's time to look forward. It's time to look for a different type of leader, and that's me. Sometimes the person with the most years of experience isn't the best at it. Sometimes you need someone who just gets it. I've read tons of leadership 
books, but that's not enough. It's actually getting to know people, being responsive. I've dealt with a lot of personnel issues. Um, also, when I was president of the American Constitution Society here in Minnesota for four terms in a row, I had to oversee a lot of issues. And I led the organization, and I continue to win awards. I've been in Time Magazine. I know what I'm doing. I'm a good leader. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend. I'm the only one up here that combines 12 years of elected official experience with uh, also a long career as a prosecutor. So I stress that this is a nonpartisan job, but it is not a non-political job when we think about the political skills that are necessary. And I've been tested by fire as a council president and as a budget chair when we had historic cuts in local government aid. Uh, I'm proud of awards that, that I shared with other budget leaders for some of the work I did partnering with R.T. Ryback on, on some of the budget changes we did in, in long-term financial plans. I can read a budget. Uh, those of you who are students of Minneapolis city government, especially in light of what happened last year with the charter changes, know that some people used to suggest the council president was the most powerful person in Minneapolis. You can debate that if you want. but. The point is that in many ways the department has directly reported to me, not me alone, to our executive committee. So uh, I have that management experience. Uh, and I also would want to stress my management philosophy. My management philosophy is uh, to encourage innovation from every single employee uh, and to create a culture of diversity, both in terms of opinions and backgrounds. Um, and coming back to perhaps my theme again of, of what I've been talking about today, uh, just an absolute commitment to, I don't care whether someone's a Republican, a Democrat, a progressive, or a liberal, or whatever you want to call them, whether they're a police officer or an advocate, I have relationships with everybody. I've built relationships with people all across the spectrum. And that's really, you know, when you really think about it, uh, you know, that's what a lawyer is supposed to do. A lawyer is supposed to look at nuance. Legal training means you look at all sides of the issue, you listen to all the input. That's the management philosophy that I have uh, and that I will pursue. Uh, I'm known by everybody that knows me as a collaborator, as someone who unites and doesn't divide, and that's the kind of leadership I'll provide. The specific question you asked was, what is our management experience in being in large public law office? I'm the only one that has that. Um, and leadership is different than management. And leading a, a large law office, and I know some of you in here work in law offices, but imagining managing 120 lawyers, that is very different. I, I, I think everybody up here is a leader in what they've done in their own respect. But I am the only one who's actually led a large law office. In 2019, the National Center for State Courts did a database study on the Public Defender's Office, which I led, and they came back and found us one of the best public defender's offices in the country. And that's because we had built an office together that changed the culture. Our culture at the public defender's office used to be very uh, lawyer-centered, and we had no training. My very first time of going to juvenile court, my supervisor was with me. He, I asked questions for five minutes, and then he said, I'm going to go back to my office. Um, if you have any questions, give me a call. And I did not know how to get my youth from the detention center to, to the actual courtroom. Managing people in a unionized shop is a challenge. The public defender's office was unionized as is, which is a good thing, the county attorney's office. You have to know how to not only talk about a vision, but put forth specific policies. That's what employees have a right to know from you. What are your expectations of me? They have to have training. And then there has to be accountability for whether they're actually doing the things that are expected of them. I have that experience, I should say, even before I became chief, I was manager of our adult division for about four years. So I've actually had over 10 years of experience in managing a large law office. My philosophy is about empowering people to be the best that they can. And that is what I will do as the next head of the county attorney. Thank you. I've had uh, experience managing two law offices in Western Hennepin County. Uh, more importantly, I go back to 
my time on the county board, I chaired the public safety uh, committee of the Hennepin County Board. I also, while in the legislature, chaired the Hennepin County delegation. The senators and house members that Hennepin County sent over to the legislature to deal with county issues that would come up. I chaired the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, during that time, uh, we had the <coughs> responsibility of reorganizing our court system. We reduced the number on the Supreme Court from nine to seven. We set up the Minnesota Court of Appeals. Uh, we combined the trial bench. We combined the municipal, the county courts with the district courts. And through that whole process, I believe I became uniquely qualified uh, to look at the budgets. I, I depend on experts, frankly. I can't, if I'm in a meeting, uh, I'm not the smartest guy there. <laughs> you know, I'm usually depending on the experts uh, in specific fields. Uh, you know, we talk about juvenile justice. You, you've got experts in juvenile justice. You've got experts in mental health. And I have to rely on those. I, I want the attorneys in our county attorney's office to do their job, follow the facts, follow the evidence, apply the law. That's what I'd expect from them. And I'd do, I'd do so in a transparent manner to serve the citizens and the taxpayers of Hennepin County. And I believe my record has been a good one of management, and I bring that to the county attorney's office. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll um, keep it simple. Uh, as far as my management experience, I've been man managing partner at two law firms as managing attorneys. Secondly, as a vice president at a Fortune 300 company uh, for over 10 years, I've managed over 300 people directly or indirectly. When I say indirectly, I have reports who manage large groups of people, over 300 people as a vice president. If you work in a corporation, you know, corporations, you spend more time dealing with human resource issues, and they have training on that week after week, month after month for 10 years. So I have significant management experience. But I do want to say, that is one part of the job. That's the traditional part of the job. The other part of the job, we need someone who's going to be out in the community, who in our troubled community, building bridges. I'm emphasizing that because that's the missing piece. I know I sound like a broken record. We can talk about all the policy we want, but as long as the prosecutor office and law enforcement is seen as the mortician and will only bring bad news, we will never build the trust and confidence in those communities. Don't misunderstand me. When I be, I'm going to be out there on a weekly basis in our diverse troubled community speaking to these young men, these community leaders. And guess what? When I have to make a hard decision, I'm going to get the slings and arrows killed. So don't misunderstand me. But I would have built the relationships. I won't need a cultural translator to understand the concerns of the community. Because I've walked in those shoes. But I am very much believe in accountability. And yes, there's many socioeconomic reasons why crime exists. I grew up under those socioeconomic reasons. But I'm the prosecutor. I can't solve all those problems. When you cross the line, then there has to be accountability. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'm the only person here who's ever worked in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. I still have colleagues there that I work with, that I call every once in a while to find out what's going on specifically with juvenile crime, with the carjackings, with expungements, with how we're going to proceed in terms of handling diversion and restorative justice as opposed to, of course, our more violent crimes. Um, some of these individuals are in the audience today. I've already told people that it was because a number of county attorneys um, came to me they didn't come to me directly. They came through one of my uh, judicial colleagues and said they wanted to jumpstart uh, my campaign and I almost freaked out. This was last year and I had no idea that that was where I was headed. In any event, um, I also was recruited away from the Hennepin County Attorney's Office by Susan Siegel of the City Attorney's Office. And I worked at the City Attorney's Office as the criminal deputy. And there I managed over 60 prosecutors 
and support staff, and that's very important. We are representing victims of crime when we're um, prosecutors. And so when I first got over there, I got to know the whole environment first, I got to know the attorneys, I spoke with each one of the attorneys individually, of course it is a smaller office than the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, and then when I was ready to institute changes, I was able to do everything that every last one of those attorneys wanted because I collaborated with them, I used them, I need them, I value them, and I value every person in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. They have value. I know that they do good work. As a judge, they've appeared in front of me, and I've seen their work. I've seen their, you know, their work product, and they are exceptional people, and we've got to give them credit We've got to get law enforcement credit. We have to collaborate with everyone and stop pointing fingers. Thank you. As much as I'd like to continue this conversation, I do want to honor the spirit of setting that time and you honor your time. So I will end this by thanking you and inviting our audience to thank you with a round of applause.